Okay. All right, welcome everybody. This is our first annual Pediatric Epilepsy Symposium um, and on improving pediatric epilepsy outcomes, advances in diagnosis, um, management and treatment. Um, you know, uh, people may know actually there's a UW game today, so traffic's a little bit uh, backed up for some people. Some people I know have been late. They're also actually working on Sandpoint Lane. So, uh, so we, we currently have almost 200 people that have registered. I think majority of people will be virtual. So we, we, we are fortunate to be in a place where we have a virtual audience. Um, also, I just want to mention uh, people that are virtual, they should put any kind of questions in their chat. And then we'll at, at the end of each of our sessions, which will be three, three uh, sessions, we'll have a question and answer panel. And hopefully at least one or two will come from our virtual audience uh, as well. So. Um, so, just to kick off the symposium, um, I'm uh, Ed, Edward uh, Rusty Novotny. I'm the director of the epilepsy program. Been here at Seattle for over a decade. I've moved from the Northeast to uh, in New England to here in the in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and we're going to have a, a, a wonderful session. And I think what's important that to, for everyone to remind everybody that the mission of Child Children's Hospital is that we provide hope, care, and cures to help every child live in the healthiest and most fulfilling life possible. So that's really the goal, not only of our epilepsy program, but Children's Hospital as a, in, in general. And not only here in, in the state of Washington, but we cover a large Pacific Northwest area. Uh, including a colleagues from uh, Washington, uh, what's often referred to as Whammy, Washington, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. Um, and to, to, to develop a program that, that we have here, which we've really evolved and grown over the last decade, it really takes a large group of people. And for, we're fortunate to have uh, three neurosurgeons that are actively involved in many of the treatments and many innovative treatments related to epilepsy. We have over 10 uh, epileptologists uh, that, that we continue to grow. We have over 20 uh, uh, electrodiagnostic or EEG technicians. Our nursing is so, so critical to our role, both in the inpatient and outpatient setting. And we have... Uh, uh, the, uh, a group that's led by several individuals. We actually have a new epilepsy coordinator position to help funnel people into our, uh, into our program. And then the, uh, and just as important in terms of both clinical and, and we have research is we have five neuroradiologists as part of our, integrated as part of our program. Our neuropsychologists have an important role and you'll hear by, from some of, one of them today. And then we have critical people, both at the, at the, at the clinical and research uh, standpoint of doing more advanced image processing and, and analysis to help us with localization and provide uh, treatment. And then from a research standpoint, we have geneticists and, and uh, very basic neuroscientists that do a lot of, do a lot of work within, in our epilepsy program. So it really takes a large group to pr provide this and you'll hear from several different people uh, as part of our program in this presentation. Um, so this, the overview of this will be, will, 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 will be divided into three parts. We'll talk about the epilepsy journey. What, what is it like for a patient to start having seizures at a certain point in their life? Over what period of time does, does how treatment evolves? And in some patients, people are very fortunate to sometimes get a cure of their epilepsy. So we'll start from an initial evaluation of first seizure, the epilepsy, inpatient epilepsy monitoring and evaluation, uh, the evaluation of brain function, which is critical, which is in what we know particularly in epilepsy. Epilepsy is not just seizures. There's a lot of comorbid psychological and other problems that are common. And then I think biggest, big advances in the last uh, decade have been neuromodulation, which are new treatments that we'll uh, emphasize. And then in, in the pediatric world, uh, genetics has, and genomics has played an important part in terms of diagnosis of epilepsy. And we'll talk, identify some of the brain malformations that typically cause seizures. A tuberous sclerosis clinic that uh, was uh, started here by uh, Stephanie Randall, who's the medical director of, our, uh, of, of the epilepsy surgery program and has started the tuberous sclerosis clinic. And then we'll have uh, Dr. Houtman talk about uh, epilepsy surgical therapies, not only for these rare genetic epilepsies, more, but more broadly. 
And then finally, we'll talk about the growth of medical management of epilepsy from anti-seizure medications, dietary therapy, and then more importantly, emphasizing uh, psychiatric and behavioral comorbidities that we commonly see uh, in, in people and patients with epilepsy. And then finally, uh, Dr. Senado will, will talk about our advances in treatment and clinical trials. Um, I want to acknowledge many of the support that we've had here uh, from many different groups uh, that, are, that many of you are probably virtual at this point. Um, both the Epilepsy Foundation from, from Washington and Oregon uh, uh, are here, and also we're, we're part of the National Epilepsy Foundation. The Rare Epilepsy Network is, is closely involved with pediatric epilepsy because there's more than 40 rare epilepsies that have been diagnosed. And that this umbrella organization, the Rare Epilepsy Network, was started by a, a national grant called the, the Patient-Centered uh, PCORI, and then also is supported by the Epilepsy Foundation. The Brain Recovery Project is a group here in the, in the West who helps a lot with identifying patients and helping patients get evaluation for epilepsy surgery in their post-op care. And then T the TS uh, group or tuberous sclerosis alliance, uh, which is a common cause of epilepsy in our pediatric patients. I want to thank many of the pharma and uh, device companies such as Jazz, Marinus, UCB, Synovian, Norellis, ISAI, Livanova, Medtronics, Neuropace, and Takeda, and many other as well. And many of them have represented here, but also probably here virtually as well. So let's uh, go on with the first session, um, which will actually Dr. Akiyama will be presenting a first case, which is a overview of an epilepsy journey. All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'd like to share a case with you guys to kind of illustrate what a journey with epilepsy can look like. All right, I have no disclosures. So our patient is a 10-year-old female with a remote history of simple febrile seizures. Suddenly she developed brief episodes of left facial numbness and tingling. And over time, these became more intense and even evolving into full body convulsions. Um, initially, they were rare, but then over, uh, over a few months, it became more um, uh, frequent, going up to like even 20 times a day. So her PCP saw her first for these concerns, ordered a routine EEG, which was reported as normal. Um, she eventually went to an outside hospital and got a, a longer EEG study that captured a seizure, and the report demonstrated um, right hemispheric onset seizures, particularly from the central parietal region of her right brain. And then she also had an MRI study at the outside hospital that was read as normal. And as far as treatment, she was first started on a medication called levetiracetam, but she kept on having seizures. So another medication called oxcarbazepine was added, but still had seizures. So she was started on her third medication, clobazam. Unfortunately, she still kept on having seizures. So at this time, she was referred to our epilepsy clinic for further evaluation. So we had recommended her going through a comprehensive phase one um, evaluation. We'll talk about in more detail with the other presenter, presenters today. But she had a long-term EEG in our hospital that also demonstrated that her seizures are right from the right side of her brain, um, specifically the central parietal region. She underwent repeat MRI in a special study called the PET study um, that demonstrated likely right temporal lobe abnormalities. She also underwent fMRI and neuropsychology evaluations. And after she underwent this phase one study, we gathered as a group, talked about all the information that was gathered, and we all agreed that she needed further evaluation to further um, decipher where exactly her seizures were arising from. So she underwent a study called the stereotactic EEG, where we actually implant very, very fine um, uh, electrodes into her brain through a small hole in the skull. And um, as seen in this picture, all these um, fine orange lines are where we place the electrodes. And during this study, we um, uh, found out that her seizures come from the right parietal opicular insular region. Um, given this information, we had another um, talk as a group, and we presented options to the families. We talked with the family saying that 
trying other anti-seizure medications were unlikely to provide significant seizure control. Um, there are various um, diet options, but these diets are very strict and very hard to follow. We thought that she probably wasn't a good candidate for these diet options. And then we talked about potential surgical options. Um, we talked about a, a traditional surgical resection, but that was probably too risky given the fact that this area of the brain is very vascular. Um, and then the other option that we presented was a laser ablation therapy, which is a newer uh, therapy. Um, it has lower risk and maybe slightly lower likelihood of complete seizure reduction, um, but the family was eager to go uh, forward with the laser ablation. And she had her seizure, uh, her, her um, laser ablation at age 11, which was about a year after her seizure onset. And now she's age 13, two years after her laser ablation. She hasn't had a seizure since her laser ablation. She's been taken off of all of her three anti-seizure medications. She's nearly a grade A student now, and she continues to be a great athlete in various sports. So I hope this illustrates how um, a course with epilepsy could look like and what treatment options there may be for our patients. Thank you. Okay. So I'm Susanna Fenstermacher. I'm one of the epilepsy APPs um, at Seattle Children's. And um, at Seattle Children's, we're lucky enough to be involved in all aspects of care from really the beginning, um, which I'll talk about today, which is near and dear to my heart, to complex epilepsy management. So um, it's really a joy to work with this team. And I'm excited to get to talk with you about our first seizure evaluation. This is how um, many of our epilepsy patients come to see us for the first time. So um, an important, important time. So I have no disclosures. Um, and so this is what I'd like to talk about today. Um, so first we'll just cover some seizure and epilepsy basics. I know everyone in the room has kind of a different background. So just getting everybody on the same page. We'll talk about the first seizure visit, some initial diagnostic studies, kind of the next steps after diagnosis, which you'll hear a lot more about in detail from my colleagues, um, and how you can help in your various roles. So starting first with seizure and epilepsy basic. So really basic, what is a seizure? What are we talking about? So a seizure is a sudden surge of electrical activity in the brain that's caused by chemical changes. And we tend to group seizures into two main categories, um, focal and generalized seizures. Focal seizures start on one side of the brain and they typically start in a small area. They can spread over time. Um, generalized seizures start on both sides of the brain at the same time. And so those are our two basic categories and you'll hear us talk about those today. Um, and then two other terms I wanted to highlight. Um, the term ictal refers to activity during a seizure, so that's symptoms or EEG findings. Post-ictal refers to symptoms or findings after a seizure, so you'll hear those terms as well. Talking a little bit more about seizure types in general, um, we have a lot of different classifications, as you might imagine. Um, so I just wanted to go through some terms that you might hear today. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to just illustrate with the um, diagram on the right, and of course this is simplified, but um, seizures can really display symptoms that anything in your brain can do, right? So any part of the brain can really um, start off with symptoms that um, reflect that function of the brain during normal times. So, um, but the, some of the topics that you might hear about today. So I like to break things down into what the word means because it helps me remember what we're talking about. So tonic refers to stiffening. So stiffening during a seizure. Clonic refers to jerking. So therefore, a tonic-clonic is stiffening followed by jerking. You may hear the term generalized tonic-clonic as the kind of convulsive seizure that many are familiar with. Um, so then atonic, right, is the absence of stiffening or the loss of tone can result in a drop seizure. Um, myoclonic, myo just meaning muscle, so muscle jerking, right? Little brief muscle jerks. Um, absent seizures, or you can think of them as absent seizures. Um, they often involve staring and behavioral arrest, and they can be quite subtle. Um, and then a couple more specific types of seizures that we don't see as commonly. Um, dechristic seizures and gelastic seizures both involve expressions of emotion that the patient's not actually experiencing during the time, so that can be quite scary for them. Um, dechristic seizures involve crying or grimacing. Um, gelastic seizures involve laughing or smirking. And then you'll also hear today about epileptic or infantile spasms. Um, this is one of the um, um, diagnoses that we often see 
um, in our clinic and that can go on to different types of treatment. And then just clarifying the term seizure and epilepsy, because I think these are often intertwined, but they have different meanings. So the way that I think about it is seizure is the event, epilepsy is the disorder, right? So we have a um, clinical definition that we use from what I think of as a superhero organization, the International League Against Epilepsy, very cool name. Um, and this is what we use in diagnosis of, C of epilepsy. So at least two unprovoked or reflex seizures more than 24 hours apart, or an unprovoked seizure with the probability of an increased probability of further seizures. And this often presents itself in the form of an abnormal EEG. Um, also included in this diagnosis is the diagnosis of an epilepsy syndrome as kind of a catch-all. Okay. So knowing all of that, talking about the first seizure visit, what happens? So um, the first thing that we often do is we ask a lot of questions, which we do in neurology. So um, these are some of the questions that we may ask during a first seizure visit. Um, first of all, what is the event of concern and are there multiple events that we're talking about? Um, when did they start happening? Were there any triggers? Were there any changes? Um, have there been any developmental changes since the onset of the event? Is the event what we call stereotyped or does it look the exact same each time that it occurs? Does it progress? Does it start one way and then spread? Does it appear involuntary? Can it be suppressed with touch or intervention? How long does it last each time? Does it cluster? And when does it happen? Is it particular times of day? These are all clues that let us know more um, about what this event might be. We also ask other helpful history questions. Past medical history, of course, plays a big role, um, but also developmental status. We take a detailed developmental history. Is there any history of delay or impairment, any current concerns? We also ask about family history. Of course, family history of seizures or epilepsy can contribute, but are there other neurologic conditions? Are there any cardiac conditions? Is there any history of syncope, fainting, or motion sickness? These can all contribute to how we're putting together the clinical picture. And after we're done with our questions, we move forward into a physical exam, of course. So we typically start with a general basic physical exam. Um, we often focus on cardiac and pulmonary status, but we look at the skin as well for um, certain macules or spots that can identify certain disorders. Um, and then we also proceed into a neurologic exam, of course, which the main parts are listed there. Um, as you might imagine, it really varies based on the age of the patient, how we're able to do this. So um, you'll often see us carrying around bags of goodies to help out with this, toys, things that flash, things that move, all are helpful. And so I wanted to just briefly um, talk a little bit about our differential diagnosis or our list of things that we're thinking about when somebody comes in to see us for events concerning for seizure. And each of these could be an hour long talk on its own. So I won't go into great detail, but um, I just wanted to illustrate that when we're seeing a patient with concern for, for seizure, we're also thinking about a lot of other diagnoses. Um, we're thinking about febrile seizures, which we know are a really common neurologic disorder of young children that don't necessarily increase your risk of epilepsy that much. Um, we look at shuddering spells or breath holding spells, especially in our infant populations. We look at fainting or cardiac events, which can often mimic seizures. Daydreaming and non-epileptic staring, we've all stared off. Probably some of you are doing it right now during this conference. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that we might look at staring that aren't necessarily like an absent seizure. And then some other atypical migraine, uh, benign paroxysmal vertigo, movement disorders, is the event occurring exclusively in sleep? Could it be a sleep disorder? And non-epileptic events. Okay. So as we're asking our questions and doing our physical, we're thinking about what comes next, right? And so these are some of the studies that we often think about next. The first one is an electroencephalogram. So this is a test, um, as you can see in our young friend there, um, where we attach electrodes, electrodes directly to the scalp to record brain activity. Um, this unfortunately doesn't tell us whether every event a child's ever had is a seizure. We wish it did. Um, but it does assess risk for future seizures and tell us whether an event captured on that EEG is a seizure in most cases. We usually start with an outpatient EEG, which is about an hour of recording. Um, and we also have prolonged studies available um, on our epilepsy monitoring unit, which we'll hear more about later. Um, during this EEG, we often um, do what we call activation procedures. These are designed to bring out subtle abnormalities that we may not see otherwise. Um, this includes flashing lights as well as hyperventilation, which we often do with our younger population blowing on a pinwheel. It's the easiest way to do that. Another thing we might consider is neuroimaging, and you'll hear um, a lot about why this is important later on in the symposium. But um, 
you can imagine that if we think um, a seizure is starting in a very specific part of the brain, it's helpful to identify if there's anything structural there that might be contributing. So we often use um, MRI as our preferred modality. Um, and as you know, this evaluates the structure of the brain. Oftentimes, children that come to see us have been through an emergency department, and so they might have had a CT scan because um, that's fast and easier. But we prefer an MRI um, for the level of detail that it gives us. Um, and I just highlighted a few um, findings that we might see with epilepsy. Um, on the left, you have an example of mesial templar sclerosis. And on the right, you have an example of a focal cortical dysplasia. Both of these could be um, really key in providing particularly surgical treatment for somebody's epilepsy. So then thinking about next steps, let's say we've made the diagnosis of epilepsy. What comes next? The first step um, are our anti-seizure medications. These are our first-line treatments. And about 50% of patients will become seizure-free with their first medicine, assuming it's, it's chosen appropriately. About another 14% will become seizure-free with their second medication. But unfortunately, after that, the likelihood of the positive response drops with each medication trial. And so there can be success, but we, we really do our absolutely absolute best to target the medication to the seizure type while also considering the patient as a whole, right? Possible side effects and coexisting conditions. Okay. We have lots of choices, as you'll hear about later. So what if medication doesn't work? And you'll hear about this later from my colleagues, but we often consider pursuing genetic testing. Um, we consider dietary therapies, such as the ketogenic or modified Atkins diets, and we consider epilepsy surgery. So that includes neuromodulation devices, such as the VNS, RNS, and DBS. We talk about laser ablation, as Dr. Akiyama mentioned. Resection and hemispherectomy are other options. So even if medication doesn't work, as you'll hear about in great detail, we do have lots of other options, and they can make a big difference in our patients' lives. And so I'd just like to close with what you can do and how you can help and how this becomes relevant to you, whatever your role is. So as primary care providers or as healthcare providers, um, the best way you can help us is a really detailed referral. As you saw, we ask a lot of questions and if some of those are answered for us, that's really helpful and saves us um, time with the patient to ask more details. Um, and the questions that I have listed there are um, a basic summary of the questions that we'll ask, but these are the things to be thinking about in the referral. This also helps us triage the referral appropriately and have your patient seen. Um, at Seattle Children's, we do have a provider line that's available to outside providers. So if you have a question and you want to talk with um, a friendly neurology provider, such as our APPs, we are often on this line. Um, so if you want to chat with me about a patient, feel free to call in through this provider line. It can be really helpful just to talk through the case. Um, and then for parents and caregivers or um, people in the community, um, detailed observations are going to be the biggest way that you can help us in triaging um, a patient case. So videos of the event of concern are wonderful if they're possible, um, but also head-to-toe observations, especially subtle observations, can be really helpful. As we talked about, the beginning of the seizure can often be a really key factor in how we're understanding where it comes from. Um, so specifically, the beginning of the event descriptions can be very helpful. Are there any patterns, any triggers, anything that you've noticed that uh, seems to be a pattern that can be helpful as well? Um, we ask that you talk to your providers about any new events of concern, um, even if it turns out to be something totally benign, something totally behavioral, not related to seizures at all. Um, we'd still rather you bring it up. So we encourage you to talk with your providers. Um, we also encourage you to investigate your family history. Um, family history is not always talked about, and it can be really helpful in making a diagnosis. And so uh, we ask you to ask your, your family when, whenever possible. Um, and then we also recommend using your online resources wisely. As we all know, the internet's a wealth of information, some of it more helpful than others. Um, and so a resource I always like to highlight um, is the Epilepsy Foundation, who's represented here today. Um, surprisingly, www.epilepsy.com. Um, I couldn't actually believe that was the, the URL when I first learned about it. Um, easy to remember and a wealth of information. It also allows you to be connected to resources and community within um, our state and nationally, and that can be a really huge part of, of treatment. So that's it from me. I look forward to questions on the panel. Thank you. Good morning. 
My name is Priya Monrad. I am the inpatient medical director of uh, neurosciences. And as we discussed, you know, when we have children who have refractory epilepsy, at some point in their medical care, they will receive a prolonged EEG, um, usually inpatient in what we call our epilepsy monitoring unit or an EMU. I have no disclosures, but what I really want to talk about today is something that in the past was not given as much priority, but I think is a really critical care in giving good epilepsy care. Because as we're about to discuss today, there have been really remarkable advancements in pediatric epilepsy care, how early we're able to detect patients that have refractory epilepsy and the quality of the care that we're able to give them, new treatments, new medications. But there's one key aspect of medicine that has really been overlooked, at least on the provider side, or downplayed. And the, that, that is the fact that, you know, everyone has to have fair and equal access to medical care. Now, anyone who has ever tried to go to the doctor knows that there are barriers to care. Location, cost, things like that, the convenience of having to take time off of work. But also, specifically, there are measurable differences in how people of different backgrounds receive medical care and also their medical outcomes. And this is true both in America, it's true around the world. And simply what this means is that, you know, differences in care led to differences in your health. So very simply, who you are sometimes will influence how healthy you can be. And that really is against, you know, the concept of fair and equal medical care. And again, this is a very complex topic. There's no way I can even begin to scratch the surface of this, especially not in 20 minutes. But I'd like to bring up some of the information that we already know about it and also review some of the initial steps that we've taken here at Seattle Children's, especially as they enter kind of this refractory epilepsy evaluation pathway with this longer inpatient EEG, some of the things that we have been able to do to try and make it more e even and fair for all these families. And the, really the goal is to make sure that people who in the past may have gotten unfairly shut out or delayed of this medical evaluation process are getting a better chance of having the same outcomes as anyone else. So, sorry, as we, you know, this is what Seattle Children's uses as its definition for uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So health equity is that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be just as healthy as they possibly can be. I wish we could uh, promise perfect health for, for, help for everyone, but that's not the case. But what's really key is that the concept of health disparity or inequity, that's differences in outcomes between populations that generally negatively affect um, certain groups. And why is this important? Again, as I mentioned, this kind of inequity specifically in the care of epilepsy, has been documented in medical uh, literature since at least the 1980s. This includes simple access to epilepsy care, um, the actual epilepsy treatment methods offered by physicians, surgery versus non-surgical treatment, for example. There's been differences documented in actual medical outcomes and also social outcomes, because as we've discussed, having epilepsy is something that affects your entire life. Your ability to go to school, your ability to drive, your ability to get married, to get a job, all of those things can be affected by having um, ongoing untreatable epilepsy. Now, unfortunately also, because this has only fairly recently been recognized as a major gap in, you know, in care that some people get, there are still big gaps in, in uh, information that we have and definitely um, information that we still have to um, uncover. So here's some examples. Again, these are some very basic examples that I found looking very quickly. So how are people affected by this you know, difference in access to care? So um, for example, there can be a difference in actual access to, uh, to reach an epileptologist. In a study performed in Canada, um, First Nations people, and those would be what would be called Native Americans down here, um, would be are a third less likely to see a neurologist for epilepsy care. And instead, they have higher utilization of ER if they're having breakthrough seizures, or they talk to their primary care doctor. And that was from 2008. Um, there's also historically different utilization of surgical treatments for epilepsy, which as we will discuss further, are very effective in the right patients if we can find them, identify them, and actually get them this kind of care. For example, in 2005, a, pap uh, a paper in neurology um, found that African-American patients, and these were adults, 
were 60% less likely than non-Hispanic white patients to receive surgical treatment for um, mesial temporal sclerosis that caused intractable temporal lobe epilepsy. Now, the relevance of this is that this is a type of, of intractable epilepsy that is curable by surgery. And so the big difference in, in access to surgical care makes a big difference in their actual medical outcome. And also, these patients may receive, have different surgical outcomes. And this is, again, another paper from 2005 in Epilepsy and Behavior um, that African Americans were more likely than non-Hispanic Caucasian patients to have seizure recurrence after surgery for this potentially curable, a surgically curable form of epilepsy. So again, these are papers from you know, 2005, 2008, which is a while ago, but not long enough ago, I would say. So as of 2021, and this is actually a very nice review that I think one of our, uh, my colleagues, Dr. Lockrow, was involved in this uh, paper. Um, what are the already identified barriers to care or what factors have been associated with lower, as we put it, lower utilization of epilepsy surgery in 2021? One of them is race. We know that um, Black and Hispanic children receive lower rates of um, pre-surgical evaluation going through all these steps that were discussed, um, getting the radiology evaluation, getting the longer EEGs, getting all of this evaluation. We know that they are less likely to receive that. Also, perhaps unsurprisingly, your insurance status will make a difference. It's lower for Medicaid. And socioeconomic status. If you are in what we call a lower socioeconomic quartile, you are, it's, it's again, this is unsurprising. It is associated with greater health disparities and lower, lower overall specialty care utilization. Now, what does that mean? That means if you have any sort of medical condition such as diabetes, epilepsy, where you would have better outcomes by being able to see a specialist, you don't get access to that specialist. And part of the reason that this is so complicated is that race, insurance status, and socioeconomic status are all intertwined as it is. So again, this is an example of how um, all of this is intertwined. And also there are many other factors that also very clearly influence our ability to access care, whether it's epilepsy care or not, that have not been adequately studied. Another thing that actually, again, as an epileptologist and as someone who um, works in the epilepsy monitor unit, to be able to get good information about people's brain electricity, to be able to understand their epilepsy and to know what options, whether it's medical or surgical, that we can op offer them, we have to be able to get a good quality EEG study. Now, as uh, Ms. Fenstermacher um, pointed out, an EEG study, you have to be able to put these little electrodes with a little bit of paste directly against the scalp to be able to record good quality um, tracing, uh, brainwave tracings. Now, Usually what we say, if you want to put something directly on the scalp, you want um, uh, any hair that is uh, uh, well-oiled or well-oiled scalp, it's a little bit harder to make things stick well. So we normally recommend everyone undo all, any sort of hair styling and wash their hair well before they get admitted. But with certain hair types, such as if you have coarse or curly or Afro-textured hair, when you wash it and you actually unbraid it, it actually makes it harder to reach the scalp. Just by, the, just by the very nature of what your hair naturally is like. And some of our techniques, and this is a little bit technical about the types of paste that you use to, to you know, put these electrodes directly on the scalp. Some of the wet electrodes work very well if you have very straight hair like mine. But if you have coarser Afro-textured hair, there are other electrode um, uh, kind of gluing techniques that might actually work better and uh, get a better connection to the scalp to get a better quality recording. And as I mentioned, you know, traditional hair preparation and dressing styles are not always addressed in the EEG prep instructions that we give families. As I mentioned, we ask people who uh, normally braid or cornrow their hair, we ask them to take it out so that it can be washed so that there's less uh, oil on the scalp. But again, that can make it difficult to actually access the scalp for the electrodes. And if you, if you kind of think about how naturally braids or cornrows work, braids or cornrows may actually expose the scalp much better than leaving it unbraided. And also, something that also kind of distressed me is that because of these factors, people with coarse or Afro-textured hair have sometimes been deliberately excluded from um, EEG studies because they're thought it's going to be difficult to get good quality data and you don't want to include good quality data, so to speak. And so a recent review 
2022 showed that when they looked at uh, EEG kind of a meta-analysis of 81 different studies, and they looked what kind of patients were actually included, were in the inclusion criteria for the, or exclusion criteria for these studies. Only five of those 81 studies explicitly included patients um, who were African-American. So again, these studies are how we determine what's normal, what's not normal, and if you deliberately exclude a subsection of the population, that is not um, really normal. So what are we doing at Seattle Children's to try to make some improvements towards this? Now, we've talked mostly about race, you know, uh, for the past couple of minutes, but also language is a huge barrier. If English is not your first language, I think everyone can imagine how difficult it is to buy groceries, much less figure out whether your child should receive brain surgery or to understand your medication options. It's hard to give conformed, uh, informed consent um, through a language barrier. So translation really can be a important equalizer in that, in that particular aspect. Also, we've been trying to make it easier for certain families to uh, have time to review the um, information that is necessary. You know, what do you do before an EEG? What to expect during your inpatient stay to get an EEG? All of that information, we have actually um, worked to put that into an app so that some families can utilize that app and um, other families can get the direct one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction with the nurse, which may be easier for them, depending on how they best learn. Also, one of the things that we're working on is really what we need to know is directly from the families, how the experience is going and what barriers they normally receive or have already noticed when they have been trying to get epilepsy care for their children. So we are working on uh, working with uh, the Seattle Children's Family Experience Team to put together an epilepsy monitoring unit specific family experience uh, group. And also as mentioned, we now have a care coordinating team which is really important as uh, point people for this really complex, long process of getting um, evaluated for epilepsy surgery or for um, trying to get uh, your child's complex refractory epilepsy under better care. And again, from a very uh, small perspective, um, we, have, we are working and we're actively trying to improve um, our preparation instructions for a wider variety of hair types. So talking very briefly about language, this is the language distribution of preferred languages at Seattle Children's Hospital. I know that's very hard to read, but 95% of patients speak one of four languages. And kind of the top ones listed here are English, Spanish, um, Vietnamese, and uh, simplified Chinese. So these are the patient, in, uh, the patient instructions or patient education that we have um, fully uh, translated. Now, a lot of our prep material to, for um, inpatient monitoring or also uh, epilepsy surgery preparation have been translated into over four languages. Some of these have been translated into nine languages. So, um, and this includes seizure first aid, uh, first aid, introduction to inpatient EEG, how to give rectal diastat, which is an emergency medicine, um, water safety, um, some of the uh, neuromodulation devices, um, the introduction to the EMU, all of these are in four to nine languages. And if you just say, well, how many of them are, are, are in two or three languages, at least two languages, we have 33 guidelines that are in at least two languages. And when it comes to actually being able to talk to families, what's really nice about Seattle Children's is that we have a very well-supported um, video and uh, phone interpretation services. We have video interpretation um, available for 25 spoken or signed languages and phone interpretation available for over 200 languages. So I mentioned we had come up with an app that gives some families a way to have easy access to all of this complex information that they may need to review when they are planning to be admitted to our epilepsy monitoring unit. Now this is called Inside Out, and it really provides a smartphone or a tablet option for families. And this also can be translated into, again, I believe it's 200 languages. So for families who are comfortable using a smartphone or a tablet, and also like to be able to go and re-review this information, and to, for example, review videos, this is actually very helpful for them. Now, of course, this is not true for every family. They may not have access to a smartphone or a tablet, or that's not the best way that they learn. But what's really important is that for the families who really can do that, 
This allows them to have this information and the families who are not comfortable with this, then the time of our epilepsy nurses who normally they go through all of this, you know, um, verbally with every the family, our nurses can spend their time more with the families that really need this one-on-one -on -one education and families who can very quickly watch videos and go through and, and, and read handouts, they don't have to, you know, have that sit down time with, with the nurse. From a provider perspective, it's also nice because then you can also see, you know, I see that they have read, you know, kind of when to show up or how to prepare for the EEG. And so you feel that, okay, I, I know that they had a chance to review this, this important information. If you hand someone a packet of papers, you can only hope that they had a chance to actually read it. So we're also working on building our family experience. Um, group. And really what we need is we need feedback from families directly. We, uh, there are so many gaps in the literature that exist. And honestly, as physicians, we have, we often have very different life experiences than our patients. And so I, I'm very aware that what we think may be obvious gaps to care may be very, you know, not at all scratching the surface of what people are noticing when they are trying to schedule things, or they're trying to understand what's going on with their child. So we're working with the uh, Seattle Children's Family Experience Group. We are working on developing um, rotating focus groups and that inside out app and also directly interviewing families that are being admitted to our epilepsy monitoring unit, if they don't use that app, is how we are planning to recruit our patients. And our goal is also specifically to make sure that we have inclusion of these historically disenfranchised groups. It's not gonna be the first 10 people who say yes on the app. We are really trying to make sure that we have a broader group of people who have a chance to have an input. So epilepsy care coordination, having a point person for this kind of complex care, it does really make a difference. Because again, there are some families who have a very well indexed binder with all of their appointments and all of their tests, and they know exactly what to do. That is a few people, but a lot of people, this is a multi-step complica uh, complicated, very technical process, which really requires the point people to be able to help guide them through this process. And having a care coordinating team really allows us to do that. And also getting direct feedback from the families, even while, while they're inpatient, allows us to make changes that make a difference. When patients are inpatient, they have the wires on their head and they have all the wires go to a machine that's carried around in a backpack. Um, and that's how we record. But if you go to the bathroom, how, where do you put this backpack? Do you put it on the bathroom floor? It doesn't seem very <laughs> hygienic. And so family said, we need a hook next to the toilet so that we can just hook our backpack and then use the toilet without having to hold onto a backpack. Again, very obvious when a family points it out, but it didn't occur to us until someone actually pointed out to us. So this is the kind of direct feedback, and we've already put in the hooks into the bathroom. So this is the kind of small but meaningful changes we can make just by getting patient feedback. So in summary, you know, better pediatric epilepsy care is going to be, it have to be a, a combination of better medical science, which we're going to discuss today, but also a better understanding of the barriers and inequities in accessing and, and applying that science that we have discovered. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Christina Patrick, and um, I'm the Director of Neuropsychology Services and Neurosciences, and I'm gonna talk today about how neuropsychology can serve patients with epilepsy and how we evaluate brain function. I have no disclosures. So first I wanna mention um, how, why epilepsy can cause neuropsychological problems. So when we have a neurological abnormality or genetic condition, um, something like a tumor or a difference in how the brain develops, that can lead to seizures. It can also lead to cognitive, emotional, and behavior problems. When patients have seizures, that can additionally lead to cognitive, emotional, and behavior problems. So we have kind of multiple things at play here that are contributing. In addition to those factors, there's a lot of other things that can contribute in patients with epilepsy. So a lot of the medications that are used to reduce the frequency or duration of seizures can actually have cognitive and behavioral side effects. Um, missing school can have 
uh, can certainly contribute to kids getting behind and learning and having difficulty catching up. Um, a lot of kids can have um, difficulty adjusting to their diagnosis, so it can be a big change in their life, and that can cause stress and emotional and behavioral problems. And there can be a lot of frustration over restrictions and new difficulties. For instance, if uh, you're a competitive swimmer and then you're told that you can't swim right now because you're having seizures, that could be really frustrating. If you're starting to have memory problems that you never had before and struggling in school, that could be really frustrating. So these things can lead to psychological, emotional, and behavioral problems as well. And then psychosocial factors. So um, there's, there's often a social impact, a, uh, family dynamics at play for kids who have epilepsy. When they have seizures in front of peers or teachers, that can have an impact on how they're treated or how they perceive that they're being treated. And that can also lead to uh, you know, mood and behavior problems. So there's a lot of ways that neuropsychologists can provide support to patients with pediatric epilepsy. And the most common way is through a comprehensive neuropsychological evaluation. So I'm going to talk about what that entails. Uh, it's a pretty comprehensive process that includes a lot of components. So we typically start with a clinical interview with the patient um, or the caregivers, depending on the patient's age and level of functioning. We do a pretty comprehensive review of records. We look through the medical record, uh, school records, any outside evaluations, IEPs, school evaluations, speech evaluations, prior neuropsychological evaluations, so that we can get a good history of kind of what's going on with this child and what are their risk factors. Um, we get information about day-to-day -day functioning, typically first through standardized questionnaires. We can often send those electronically. Um, and have the parent fill those out, sometimes the teacher, sometimes the patient themselves, depending on the need and, again, the patient's level of functioning. And then we do a lot of observation of the patient's behavior. So some of the things that we're looking for there are how well is the patient able to pay attention? Um, are there any speech abnormalities, anything that, um, you know, any difficulties with talking? Um, other kinds of language problems like trouble understanding information or understanding directions, any motor differences that we're noticing, and a lot of times we're really tr looking for does one side um, have poor motor functioning than the other, any visual difficulties, and again, we're often looking for are they having trouble seeing or perceiving information on one side more than the other, and then we spend the bulk of our time um, doing standardized psychological tests and looking at their performance, the child's performance on those tests compared to other kids their age. We assess a lot of different domains. When we do neuropsychological evaluations in general, we don't necessarily assess all of these domains, but with patients with epilepsy, we typically do because pretty much any of these areas are, can be impacted by epilepsy. So we're first going to look at their kind of general cognitive ability or intellectual functioning, get an IQ score. That's probably the test that uh, people are most familiar with. But we're also looking at a lot of other different domains. So things like their verbal skills, um, how well they're able to process visual information, uh, perceive information, solve visual puzzles, things like that. How well they're able to remember information and we try to assess learning and memory for both visual and verbal information, and we're often looking at are there differences in, in memory for those different domains. Attention and executive functioning, um, which can include things like processing speed, uh, multitasking, inhibition, uh, planning, problem solving, how well um, the child is able to switch from one task to another, really kind of that executive control. And then motor skills, like I mentioned, we don't spend a lot of time on motor testing, but we're typically looking at fine motor skills and, again, trying to compare if one hand looks worse than the other. Academic skills, this can be really variable how much we're looking at this. So if the, we might just do a screening of academic skills, but if the goal of the evaluation is really to see if the child needs more support at school, we might do quite comprehensive academic testing. So that can vary quite a bit. Adaptive functioning, we typically assess by talking to the parent and by getting having the parent fill out a standardized questionnaire. Because what we're looking for with adaptive functioning is how is the child functioning in day-to-day -day life? What are they doing at home and in the community, uh, which we can't really get from doing testing in a clinic environment. 
And then emotional and behavioral functioning, as I mentioned, is also assessed through those questionnaires and then also through uh, parent and patient interview and observations. The impressions, the information that we're able to get from all of that data, um, first and foremost, we get a neuropsychological profile. So we can see what are the strengths, what are this child's strengths and weaknesses? You know, are they, do they have good verbal skills, but they really struggle with visual information? Uh, do they have good memory, but they really struggle with attention and executive function? And we use that information to help us figure out kind of what's going on in their brain. So are there certain areas of, of the brain that seem to be not functioning as well? Because there are certain areas of the brain that are associated with different skills. So by assessing those skills, we often can see that um, you know, certain areas of the brain are, are functioning less well than others. And we're looking both for lateralization, so is one side of the brain more efficient or doing better than the other? And then localization, are there more uh, specific areas of the brain, like the frontal lobes or the temporal lobes, that seem to be more problematic? We're looking for other things like reorganization of language skills. So most people have, um, their language is controlled by the left hemisphere, but there's a small percentage of people who just naturally have language function on the right side. And then in epilepsy, especially left hemisphere epilepsy, there's a larger percentage who have uh, language functioning on the right side because their brain may have adapted and developed differently to compensate for the problems that are going on in the left hemisphere. And then we're putting all of that information together and talking about how it ties to their medical history. Is this a profile that we would expect given this type of epilepsy? Um, do we think that medications are contributing to any cognitive problems? Uh, do we think that there's, is there a family history that might be contributing? For instance, is there a strong family history of ADHD? Many family members have ADHD. Then in addition to the epilepsy being a risk factor for ADHD, we also had the family history. And so that might put the child at a higher risk for, for that diagnosis. And then we're going on to make those types of diagnoses. So the, definitely the most common diagnosis that I make is ADHD. Um, about 30 to 40% of children with epilepsy actually meet criteria for ADHD, so it's a really big risk factor. Um, and I would argue in the kids that I see, which tend to be more of the, the kids who have poor controlled epilepsy, it's even higher. And then other types of diagnoses that I often make are learning disorders, learning disabilities, and autism, and other types of uh, behavioral and mood diagnoses. We're also thinking about what are the risks and prognostic factors. So what do we expect um, this child may have difficulty with in the future that we need to watch out for? Um, and do we think that they're likely to get better, to stay on the same trajectory, or potentially to get worse? And so what supports does, might the child need in the future even if they're not needing them right now? And then of course we look at resiliency and protective factors. So what are the strengths that this child has that can be used you know, and capitalized on to make sure that they're best supported and, and developing in the best way possible? The most common evaluations that I'm seeing right now is um, pre-surgical evaluations. So the phase one evaluations that were already discussed, the neuropsych evaluation is part of that. And we have some specific goals for pre-surgical evaluations. So first and foremost, we're trying to localize the area of seizure focus. Uh, so as I mentioned, we can often tell by which skills the child is having difficulty with, what, um, which area of the brain is likely impacted, and, and then potentially that might tell us that the seizures are coming from that area. Um, we are also looking for that lateralization and localization of cognitive dysfunction. So maybe we already know where the seizures are coming from, and then what I'm doing is looking at, okay, does that area where the seizures are coming from seem to be not working as well for cognitive skills um, as, you know, as we would expect in a typically developing child or a child who doesn't have epilepsy? Again, the lateralization of language, as, um, as I mentioned, and one of the things that we're hoping for, for instance, in a child who has seizures coming from the left hemisphere, if that might be a place that we're going to think of as a surgical target, we're often hoping that their, their language has reorganized to the right hemisphere because then that certainly means lower risk of language decline if the child does have surgery. 
we're just trying to get a baseline of their cognitive, behavioral, and social functioning before surgery so that we can use that to compare if there's any differences following surgery. And then we're looking at what are the risks and what do we expect to be the prognosis following surgery. And most, I'm most focused on the cognitive risks and prognosis. So um, often in children who have more widespread cognitive deficits, um, they're going to be more likely to kind of still have those uh, difficulties after, but with more focal problems, um, you know, areas in just uh, difficulty in just certain areas, um, we sometimes will see an improvement following surgery. Most often following surgery, things stay the same cognitively, but we're looking at different factors for might things get better, might things get worse, or again, might they stay the same. And then we also can say a bit about the likelihood of seizure freedom. And again, that's if there's kind of more widespread cognitive deficits, then the chance for seizure freedom is a little bit lower following surgery because, uh, again, it seems likely at that point that the entire brain or a larger area of the brain is impacted, where if we have those focal deficits, then it might be just a small target that can kind of make things better and make the seizures go away. The common recommendations that we make, a lot, we make a lot of recommendations about educational functioning, their, um, whether they should have an IEP, a Section 504 plan, and what kinds of support should be included in those, in those plans. Um, we often make recommendations for clinical therapies, like a speech language evaluation or therapy, occupational physical therapies, and those types of therapies can be given in the home and um, sorry, in the school and outpatient settings. And there are actually two different routes to qualify for that, and you can qualify for both. So we're, we're often providing education about that as well. Um, behavioral health type services, so counseling, behavior therapy, psychiatry, and we're, we're trying to get um, children linked up with that as quickly as possible. And um, because there's often quite a long wait for these types of services, seeing if we can at least get them into some short-term services first, um, if we can link them up with social work to look for resources that, that might work for them. Talking about activities to improve social and emotional functioning and how those activities might need to be adapted to fit within uh, the restrictions that they might have because of their seizures. And then we sometimes will recommend medication changes. So um, if we think that the medications are causing specific cognitive effects, then we might talk to the neurologist about, is there another medication you could switch them to that might work just as well, but might not have as many cognitive or behavioral side effects? I do like to always let parents know that seizure frequency is the biggest predictor of cognitive functioning. And so if a medication change is going to increase seizure frequency, then we're probably going to want to just keep the medication where it is, and you're going to get a net gain even if the medication is causing some cognitive problems. So it's always kind of looking at that balance. And then sometimes we'll recommend stimulant medication for ADHD. In most cases, um, stimulant medication is safe in children with epilepsy, and it is often very effective. I've seen big improvements in kids who, who are um, taking stimulants or other um, ADHD medications um, if that's a route that the family wants to go with. And then again, talking about candidacy for surgery. One of the things that I'll look at not just um, the, the things that I've already discussed about candidacy, but also are there additional procedures that we need to determine the cognitive risks? One of the procedures that can be helpful in determining cognitive risks for surgery is a functional MRI. And we do these with pretty much all of our patients who are undergoing epilepsy surgery evaluation. It, oh, it's, the sizing is a little bit off here, but... Um, so there's different, uh, these are the different tasks that we do for a functional MRI assessment. So there's um, motor language, and I'm sorry, it's cut off. It's motor language and memory tasks. Um, and so I asterisk the most common ones that we, that we give. Um, so for motor, for looking at motor function, we'll typically do finger tapping. And what we're expecting is activation on the contralateral or other side. Um, so if you're tapping your left hand, then we expect activation on the right side um, in the sensory motor and supplementary or motor areas. Um, for language, we're often doing a verb generation task, a sentence generation task, sometimes for younger kids, just object labeling. And we're typically expecting activation in the left hemisphere, as I mentioned, and 
We're looking for Broca's area, which controls speech, and Wernicke's area, which controls comprehension. And for memory, um, we're typically doing a visualization task, having the child visualize their home environment, their school environment, and doing different tasks in those environments. Um, and we're expecting activation in the middle part of the temporal lobes, the hippocampal area, and the surrounding area. So this is kind of a typical um, pattern of activation that we'll see in functional MRI. Um, so motor, this would be, this is the right side of the brain, so this would be left hand movement. This is the left side of the brain, so it would be right hand movement. Um, language, you can see the, the yellow and orange areas are the areas of activation, and there's quite a bit throughout the left hemisphere. And then for memory, this is the middle part of the brain, and we've got the hippocampi on both sides that are lighting up. Um, so what's happening to cause this uh, lighting up is that areas of, those areas of the brain are recruiting more oxygen and getting more blood flow, and that's why we're able to see where, um, where that's activated. So there are a lot of advantages to functional MRI. Um, it's non-invasive. It's typically pretty easy to learn and requires fairly minimal time and resources. And it gives you pretty good localization to the hemisphere and to the general region of activity. But there's some disadvantages, very sensitive to movement. Um, so they, the child has to stay very still. Um, we actually have the child do the tasks in their head, not out loud. So it's very difficult to monitor performance. We don't know if they're actually doing the tasks other than by seeing if the areas of the brain that we expect are being activated. The localization is not super precise, and in fact, it tends to actually overestimate um, how widespread uh, the area of the brain that's being activated is. And as I mentioned, the fMRI really just tells us where blood is flowing, so it's kind of a proxy for location of functioning. It doesn't tell us which parts of the brain are necessary for function. Um, and so there's some other procedures that we can use that are more invasive, and, and we try not to go invasive unless we need to, but um, cortical mapping would be the next step if we need more information about where language and motor functioning are coming from. So these are some different language tasks that we do um, for cortical stimulation. So, um, oh, and I first, should first mention that's placing electrodes directly on the brain. So this is a surgical procedure. And then usually a few days later, we'll do um, the testing of motor and language function. So some of the language tasks that we do might be just labeling objects, um, pointing to different objects, comp uh, answering questions, reading passages, and um, answering questions about reading um, what's been read. So to assess different areas of language. And then what we do is stimulate a small section of the brain while doing the task. So we're effectively knocking out that part of the brain for, for a short period of time. So we can see, is the child able to continue doing the task even when that area of the brain is knocked out? Um, if so, they probably don't need that area for language. Um, if there's a disruption to language, then that area might be important <laughs> for language. Um, if there's a motor or sensory change, then that area is probably important for motor function or sensation. If stimulation in that area provokes a seizure, that might tell us that that's an area of seizure focus, where seizures are coming from. Ideally, what we want to see is that stimulation in locations that provoke a seizure also don't disrupt motor or language functioning, because that means that that might be a good surgical target that's not going to cause a change in language or motor functioning. Um, we will do this task sometimes with, a, um, like I mentioned, a grid or um, SEEG placement, or sometimes we do it right during, like in surgery, um, right before resection. Um, so we'll wake the patient up, and then they'll typically go back to sleep, and then they'll do the resection right after. So in summary, children with epilepsy are at increased risk for problems with cognitive, behavioral, and emotional functioning, and neuropsychology can be helpful in a variety of ways. Uh, comprehensive neuropsych evaluations can provide information about strengths and weaknesses, the impact of seizures on functioning, where seizures might be coming from, provides diagnoses, and, um, and then give recommendations for educational and clinical interventions that might support the child. Functional MRI can provide information about which areas of the brain are important for motor language and memory. Um, and cortical mapping is more invasive, but can provide more accurate information related to seizure focus and areas of the brain that are essential for motor and language functioning. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Lian Bozar, a neurologist work at the Seattle Children's Hospital. Good morning. I'm Hannah Goldstein, one of the neurosurgeons at Seattle Children's. So we are talk about uh, neurostimulation together today. Um, I will start. Um, Hannah, I, we do not have anything to disclose. Can you hear me okay? For sure. So today we're going to focus on three FDA approved devices, including VNIs, DBS, and RIs. The main focus will be the efficacy and the adverse effects. And uh, Hannah will talk about the surgical pers perspective and the summary. So as we know that about 1% of the population um, who had a diagnosis of epilepsy, and among these patients, about 30% patient are drug resistant. So in among these 30% patients, about 50% patients respond to resective surgery, which is the first line therapy for drug resistant epilepsy. And that left about 15% patient that do not have a optimal treatment. So neuromodulation can provide a treatment gap in, for those patients. So we have a three FDA approved devices, including VNS, TBS, and RIs, which will be the focus for today. And there's also two devices that are approved in Europe. One is transcutaneous VNS and a trigeminal nerve stimulation. And there are also other three devices that were not approved by FDA out in the Europe. These are TMS and chronic sub-threshold sub cortical stimulation and the transcranial uh, direct current stimulation. And I'm running the clinical trial right now at the Seattle Children's Hospital. So what are the mechanisms of action for brain stimulation? There are two theories. Number one is electrical stimulation can enhance the inhibition of and the frequency modulation. So that interrupts seizure onset and about the seizure. The other theory is that electrical stimulation alters epileptic network stimulation of the crucial network locations. The most common one, the first one, we know have the approved with the vegan nerve stimulation and the thalamus, basal ganglia, and the other regions. So there are two modules for the brain stimulation. The most common one, the first one was open loop stimulation. So that means the time determines the stimulation. Like VNIs, we stimulate about 30 seconds and then out for five minutes, and that's the, the regular stimulation. And the other one is closed-loop closed stimulation, such as RNS, basically is seizure detection determines stimulation, or seizure prediction determines the stimulation. So the monitor constantly getting feedback from our uh, brain activity. Then if a certain pattern was detected and it triggered a treatment delivery of this electrical stimulation. So that's are the three FDA approved devices. The Vigo, Vigo nerve stimulation was approved in 1997 and later on approved for pediatrics. In US is four years above. In Europe, there are no, leash, uh, no, no age limitations. And the second device is deep brain stimulation, which has been around for a long, long time. But in, two, in 2018 was approved in adult for focal onset epilepsy. And then the lastly is the closed loop responsive neurostimulation um, by Neuropace was approved in 2013 for adult with focal onset epilepsy. Uh, I will skip this one for the mechanisms, the time being. So I will talk a little bit on the efficacy overall for the VNS first. So the large retrospect study for the VNS patient outcome registry showed from three months to two years, the significant seizure reduction from 46% up to 62% by two years. And then there are studies for the efficacy by the age group. You can see for pediatric patient population, 
after two years therapy has much better response for adult population, particularly for patients less than six years old has the best response. And then the study based on the seizure type, I think the response, the, the efficacy is sold by all seizure types, but the best one, the greatest response for the seizure auras for the focal epilepsy, and the lowest response is the primary generalized tonic, tonic clonic seizure and the secondary generalized tonic clonic seizure. But it works for all type of seizures. And then for me, for being a pediatric neurologist, we take care of lots of patients with landlord gossel syndrome. And I think this is a really good study. Look at the one year's um, therapy, the efficacy in patients with LGS and other types of epileptic encephalopathy, but not qualified for LGS. But compared to these two groups, so the patient with LGS has the best response for with vigorous nerve stimulation for over 60% efficacy compared to other group is less, is a little bit over 50%. So that is very encouraging data for us to use this um, therapy for our patient with LTS. So I put this slide in because of the current treatment options for LTS. Um, VNS is a very common one, and the topos colosolomy is another one. It's very commonly used in this patient population. By comparing the efficacy, you can see I can, from the back of the, the table first, for complex partial seizures and the mild clonic, clonic seizures, there's no significant difference for these two types of therapies. However, for the atonic seizures, corpus colosolomy has the best result. So about over 80% patient has seizure reduction, more than 50%. And even for tonic and the tonic clonic seizures, I think corpus colosolomy has better result than the vigor nerve stimulation. Clinically, I think combine these two treatment op options will provide a best result potentially. I will skip this slide. And then just have to talk about surgical perspective. So a little bit more just about kind of the device itself, what it entails. Um, as Zhang mentioned, it was first approved you know, over two decades ago. So as far as neuromodulation devices go, it is definitely the one that we have the most data on. And so a lot of the studies, um, you know, we just, we have more results there. It's been used in adults and in the pediatric population for, you know, over two decades now. Uh, what it entails physically are three coils that are placed around the left vagus nerve in the neck. Um, and I'll go through in a little bit more detail some of the surgical steps. And then those are connected to a generator, which is implanted in the chest, sort of like a pacemaker. Uh, the generators have become better in terms of battery life over the course of the last two decades. Uh, there's a couple of different models that we choose based on both size of the patient um, the smallest model, which we put in really our, our tiniest patients, uh, unfortunately does have a shorter battery life, right? One that's sort of intuitive, it's just a smaller battery. It doesn't last as long. Um, and depending on the settings, the reason why there's such a big range is it depends on how often the stimulation is going. So it lasts really anywhere from two to six years. The larger model, which is still uh, relatively small, you know, it's probably about that big. <laughs> Um, does last for anywhere from about four to 10 years, again, dependent on the rate of stimulation. And when it's adjusted or interrogated, uh, we can check kind of approximately how much battery life is left so that hopefully we're replacing it before it's completely depleted. The other difference in the models is the smallest model is actually now the newest one and has an auto ramp up mode. So originally when it's placed uh, we don't turn it on right away and patients come in to have it adjusted and, and find kind of the correct settings. And so we do have certain patients that live, you know, far away, whether it's Alaska or Montana or, you know, just areas where it is more difficult for them to come in and have those adjustments made fairly frequently up front. And so we're able to put in that model where it itself ramps up, you know, every couple of weeks. 
when those kids come back, whether they've grown, so now they're big enough for the larger model or we know their setting, we can then change it out for the larger model so we don't have to replace it as frequently. So it works kind of in three mechanisms. There's that baseline stimulation that Dr. Bozarth talked about, um, which is set by the neurologist. And so, you know, it's kind of time-based, frequency-based, and we ramp that up. Also, patients and their families are given a magnet. And so a lot of patients either have an aura before their seizure starts or a seizure starts, and the patient or the family can swipe the magnet directly over the device. And the idea is that that sends an extra stimulation, and that should kind of stop the seizure in its tracks, abort it. And, and that makes a big difference. Sometimes you can actually stop it before it turns into a full-blown seizure or for kids that you know, end up having prolonged seizures or a cluster of seizures, it can kind of abort that early on. And then the newer models of the VNS also do have a heart rate detection mode. And so many seizures are associated with a sudden tachycardia. And uh, as the device sits on the vagus nerve, it can detect changes in the heart rate. And so anytime it detects a sudden increase in the heart rate, it again kind of fires that extra stimulation with the idea being to stop the seizure very early on or before it turns into a clinical seizure. So in terms of this, the surgery itself, the initial surgery does involve two incisions. There's a single incision uh, in one of the neck creases. The neck actually heals beautifully. Often these are almost impossible to see. Um, we go in and, and find the vagus nerve and then place very small coils around the nerve. And then a second incision, which we make sort of laterally here so that from a cosmetic standpoint, pretty much everything is hidden. Um, let me see, does this work? Yeah. Uh, so you can kind of see here, right, this would be, and, and this is an adult patient. I think most of our pediatric patients don't have beards. Occasionally they do. Um, but again, kind of a, just a linear incision along the neck. And then this is uh, kind of the lateral chest wall. And you can see during surgery, the coils uh, are implanted around the nerve here. There's a loop of coil that kind of comes down and then it gets pulled through and connected to the generator here, which gets tucked into that pocket. There is a slight bulge under the skin, depending on kind of how small or, you know, the child is. You certainly can feel a bump, sometimes see a little bit of a bump, generally covered by most shirts. When we go back in and replace the battery, all we have to do is open up the chest incision. We don't have to go back into the neck. So anytime I talk about surgery, I always have to include risks um, and adverse effects. So for all of these devices, there are risks related to surgery itself and then risks related to the device. Anytime we do surgery, it is a foreign device, so there is a risk of infection. Um, we've gotten that risk down quite a bit. You know, it's certainly a completely sterile procedure. We use antibiotic irrigation. We actually leave antibiotic powder in the incision, but any time we do surgery, that risk kind of starts again. So with the initial implantation and with each uh, battery revision, that risk is down to about 1% um, per surgery. The other sort of more common things that we see with the vagal nerve stimulation itself are some changes in terms of voice alteration and hoarseness, dyspnea, cough. Those are typically all seen uh, with higher stimulation parameters and sometimes can be an indication that we need to then decrease the stimulation parameters. Um, less common but reported are things like neck pain, paresthesias, uh, central sleep apnea, and then nausea and headaches. You know, if you study enough people, there's, there's a lot of things that get reported that may or may not be exactly related to the device. So I'm gonna just go through um, one patient of ours you know, this is kind of our, and as a case example, now an 18-year-old girl um, had a prenatal stroke, intractable epilepsy, started having seizures at seven years of age, multiple seizure types. And uh, Dr. Houtman will talk later this afternoon about resective surgery. Dr. Bozar mentioned that, you know, that's sort of our first line of treatment for, for kids with medication refractory epilepsy. Um, but often when there's multiple seizure types coming from multiple locations, they're not a resective surgery candidate, and that's when we get into neuromodulation. So she was having four to five seizures per day, had failed a handful of medications, 
Um, and her EEG showed both right as well as left-sided onset seizures. So again, not a, a candidate to go in and, and take out, you know, kind of seizure foci coming from all over the brain. She had a VNS placed at around 10 years of age. Um, we've lifted the current settings here. I think, you know, again, each kid gets adjusted. Uh, and she actually had a, a really impressive response. So one year after it was placed, she was actually seizure free. And that's something that's important that we talk to families about. The efficacy takes time as we ramp up the settings. So different from medications where you often get, you know, sort of an immediate benefit and that may actually wear off over time. The opposite is true with these devices where it takes time to see that benefit often up to about a year. But then once you have a benefit, generally speaking, it is sustained. You don't have that same kind of wear off effect. Uh, she was actually able to wean off of Depakote. Um, when we took off further medications, some of her seizures did come back. And so those were restarted and eight years out from placement, she's having rare seizures. So a huge difference from her four to five seizures a day. All right, so this, uh, we're going to talk about the uh, next device, uh, deep brain stimulation. Um, so this, as I mentioned before, was, uh, has been around for movement disorder for a long time. So FDA approved for the, uh, so DBS placed anterior nucleus thalamus for intractable focal epilepsy. So there were multiple study and multiple sites, um, not only in the thalamus, even cerebellum, hippocampus, uh, central medium, and uh, subthalamic nucleus. They all showed a certain degree of efficacy. So I will skip the rationale when the Sunday trial used anterior nucleus, uh, also the efficacy. So the central trial is the trial lead into the FDA approval for the uh, focal onset epilepsy. So in that trial, 110 patients was included with focal or focal with generalized, uh, secondary generalized um, seizures. Uh, in those patients, about 4.5% patients has had a primary general seizures. So the efficacy in this trial is quite impressive, in fact, by three months, to show the 40.4% patient has seizure reduction. It didn't sound like very high, but you compare for the control group, only 14.5%. So that is pretty remarkable. But year seven after the plantation, about 75% seizure reduction rate. And it also shows some other benefits, including improved quality of life, cognitive improvement and the mood improvement and the reducing medical side effects. Um, these are the plus um, is that um, including the seizure reduction too. So there are some other case studies I put it down here because there's no much evidence for those devices in our pediatric patient population. There's one trial called the STEL trial for LGS patient including pa pediatric and adults. Unfortunately, this trial failed the primary outcome goal, which was the seizure reduction at three months afterwards. However, at a nine month follow up, they did show some efficacy about over 50% patient had seizure reduction. And there are some other case or case series in pediatric patient population for the central medium implantation for the DBS. So this is a study including 13 patients and nine patients uh, is our pediatric patient population and also showed a remarkable seizure reduction, about 80% seizure uh, reduction, and the two pediatric patients became uh, seizure free. So this is I leave to Hannah. So again, in terms of surgery, we do still have that kind of two decade plus experience with DBS implantation. It's not new from a surgical perspective. Um, it's just expanding from a uh, indications perspective. So most people know of DBS for Parkinson's disease, which is sort of what it was originally approved for um, and has had great efficacy uh, in adult patients with Parkinson's. It's been trialed for a lot of other things and then more recently approved for medically refractory epilepsy. 
Um, it involves two electrodes that are implanted into the brain, and then similar to the VNS, the generator is implanted in the chest. Uh, and, and again, the battery lasts somewhere upwards of five years um, when it needs to be replaced. Again, it's just sort of the soft tissue part of it. Um, so in terms of the surgery itself uh, and exact implantation, we use a combination of um, sort of planning software. All these patients get very detailed imaging, and it basically gives us a 3D sequence of the brain, which is sort of like GPS for the brain. And based on that, certain anatomic landmarks, deciding where we're going to target exactly which nucleus in the thalamus, we set our target points. Um, and then on the planning software, it actually, you know, we create a trajectory that goes from kind of the top of the skull to our targets, making sure that we avoid things like the ventricle, other important nuclei. Um, and the implantation is actually done with the help of a surgical robot that sort of lines up our trajectories very precisely um, and makes sure that the electrodes are implanted exactly where we want them. It's generally, depending a lot of these kids, especially as some of these things are newer, many of these patients have had other surgeries in the past and failed those. So whether it was a resective surgery or a corpus callosotomy. So incisions are sometimes designed based on prior scalp incisions. Um, if it's sort of a fresh incision, you can actually just do two small incisions, one on either side of the head. Um, it is brain surgery, but from a neurosurgery perspective, it's sort of minimally invasive. It's a very small opening in the surface of the brain, and we're just passing an electrode kind of through the brain all stereotactically. They then kind of similarly get tunneled down um, behind the ear. Everything's under the skin. And then there's a, a chest pocket for the battery itself, which you can sort of see here. Again, there's always some risks involved. A uh, similar thing, it's a foreign device, and so there is some risk of infection. Um, there is also some risk of bleeding. Anytime we pass anything through the brain, uh, you know, as much as we plan to avoid any sort of blood vessel, that risk cannot be zero. Um, occasionally, you can have the electrodes implanted you know, in the wrong position. Uh, there have been reports of headaches. Um, and then some of these other things, again, when you actually look at the data in terms of the rates of mood issues, um, memory problems in the general epilepsy population, and, and remember that most of these studies were done in adults, but as is discussed previously, a lot of these patients do have many comorbidities. And so there's a certain amount of depression that you see in the epilepsy population. And so uh, most of the studies have shown that it's not really significantly more than would be expected in someone with a seizure disorder. Um, so a case example, again, of ours. This is a 14-year-old girl, had refractory left frontal epilepsy, uh, had started having seizures at eight years old, and uh, had a VNS placed. Um, we so had actually did undergo resective surgery, right? It seemed to be sort of more focal onset epilepsy, had a resection at 13 years, uh, but continued to have seizures. And so after discussions with sort of our epilepsy group and the family, they elected to have a DBS placed rather than further resective surgery, which would potentially result in uh, motor weakness or language issues um, based on kind of location. And um, once the DBS was placed, she actually has no more GTCs, has very good seizure control, is still on medication, although if you look at her previous meds, I'm not going to attempt to name all of these, but they're very extensive, and she's down to just a single medication along with her DBS. So the last device we're going to talk about is a responsive neurostimulation. Um, this picture shows this is a device. Um, the monitor is under the, the skin, on the scalp, and then they have electrode placement. And the patient family have this remote monitoring. When they investigate the, 
the device they download the data to their computer, and the family will upload, upload the data into the, the database called the PDMS, and the physician use physician tablet um, to review the data. And we can also review the data on the website. So the FDA approved indication for patients over 18 years old uh, using more than two medications and with focal onset of seizures with one or two seizure foci. And then you see the location is a multiple location. I think in the trial it's mostly is the mesial temporal lobe by unilateral or bilateral. And there are other locations, um, eloquent cortex or insular, or after resection still need RNA placement and the deviations. Most common, most common one is that periventricular nodular heterotopia and dysplasia. So this is the pivotal trial lead that uh, the FDA approved for the for device. So this is three months uh, during the trial. So the seizure reduction rate is about 36%. It didn't look like that high, but for the control, it has a much lower response rate. So statistically significant. And over the time of the, the trial, um, the efficacy increased more than 50% at the two years mark. So this data is from the neural pace. So the long-term efficacy is getting better over time. So by year nine, there was 75% patient have seizure reduction. And then I think by, uh, there was 28% patients with at least one period, more than six months of seizure freedom. Uh, and they also saw the other benefit, um, significantly reduce the pseudep risk, and that is a big concern for our patient population. And so the improvement of quality of life overall, including cognitive, mental health, physically. So as, a, as I said, the RNS utilization in PDIC population is rare. Um, we, we are using this device in some of patient population. I will give you one example. But I just put a few um, case report here. So the response, pretty good. So six, 16 years old female had a six month follow up with significant seizure reduction. And there are two case reports from nine years old to 14 years old. They also the significant seizure reduction at a 12 month, old, 12 month and a 19 month follow up. And there also case report for generalized epilepsy, which is a significant challenge in our patient population. So this placement, RS placement in the anterior nucleus thalamus, 30, 35 years old with intractable genetic generalized epilepsy, multiple seizure types, and then two years follow up, so the 90 to 95% seizure reduction rate. I think this can this is better than any medication can provide. And there were two cases reported with a central medium implantation for RNS for LGS patient. Both sold seizure um, reduction from 75 to 90 percent seizure reduction rate at one year follow up. So even though the case is not very many, but pretty impressive result. And there was also one case report for CM implantation for generalized epilepsy. As we know, um, the theory right now is CMRIs may be good for patients with generalized epilepsy, but anterior nucleus RIs might be good for focal onset epilepsy. So in this one, this patient has a Epsom's epilepsy syndrome uh, refractory to Medic multiple medications also fail, failed diet. And then with CMRIs plantation at a six month follow up, sorry, um, Epsom seizures fully controlled. Uh, still have some GTCs, but reduced from the baseline. So the other benefit from the, as you know that because the device currently monitor our brain activities. So there are accumulated benefit with the ECOG data. 
um, we can monitor um, the side effects, um, the other effects for the treatment, such as aid on medication, did that help with seizures or not? And then for further seizure lo localization, potentially maybe the patient have a further resection and definitely will help identify seizure triggers and then review the seizure cycles so when the most times seizure occurs, many patients have nocturnal seizures, which will help us target either the RNS or the medication treatment. So, so RNS, as all of these devices, was first approved in the adult population. Um, and I think that's important to recognize in this situation, just in that you know, adults have some similar seizure patterns, but are also different. So kind of the initial indications were for bilateral mesial temporal sclerosis. We know that we can take out one kind of anterior temporal lobe uh, hippocampus, but we can't take out both without pretty significant effects on memory. Um, that's much more common pathology in the adult population than in the pediatric population. So that was sort of the initial thought was actually localizable epilepsy with two targets that we cannot resect. Um, and then also kind of seizures arising from eloquent cortex. So in children, we probably have a, a lower threshold to do larger resective surgeries because kids get better. They recover a lot better than adults, and we know how burdensome ongoing uncontrolled seizures are for brain development. Um, in adults, the calculation is a little bit different. We have now sort of expanded the targets for RNS. So we're targeting both if there's multiple, you know, sort of two localized spots that we either can't take out or don't feel comfortable taking out. Um, seizures coming from eloquent cortex or when it's more of a generalized pattern, multifocal epilepsy, very similar to DBS, where we're implanting the electrodes deep within the thalamic nuclei to try to target overall activity. Um, so, so the options are really either deep uh, electrodes or cortical electrodes that, that work on the surface of the brain. In terms of the brain piece of it, it's fairly similar to the DBS surgery, um, especially when they're targeted deep the electrodes get passed, uh, again, using that stereotactic guidance, the robot and surgery. Kids love that they get a robot <laughs> to do their surgery. Um, when they're surface, again, we, we use uh, similarly stereotactic guidance and they're passed through pretty small openings in the skull. The main difference is that the battery, the generator, is actually implanted in the skull. Um, and that's because the device is, is more sensitive because it's constantly monitoring brain activity. And so if it were to go down the neck and be implanted in the chest, there's too much muscle artifact when the patients move their head um, for it to work properly. So it gets implanted directly in the skull. Uh, the battery life when the device first came out was only about three to four years. It's now upwards of eight years. Again, somewhat variable depending on how often it's triggering, right? So how often these kids are having seizures. The difference with RNS compared to the other devices is it really is only triggering in response to what it detects as seizure onset. Um, or, or kind of activity leading into seizures. So it uh, is sort of on less of the time in a way, even though it's constantly monitoring. Um, and supposedly they are coming out with even longer lasting batteries. The difference is that we do have to reopen the scalp and not just the chest, although we don't have to go back into the brain. So in terms of the surgery itself, I kind of already talked about the brain piece of it. Um, in terms of the scalp, we actually... Uh, drill out so the, the skull is thick enough that you can basically drill out a pocket to put the generator in. We leave a thin rim of bone, so there's still bone covering the brain and the, the dura, the outer lining of the brain, but the generator itself essentially sits flush with the skull. And so there's not you know, a big bulge on the top or the side of your head. The exact place of it depends on where we are placing the leads. So again, if we're doing thalamic targets, the leads come in from up top. But if they're you know, potentially targeted, it, it can be anywhere, occipital, temporal. Um, so based on that, we design our incision and design where the generator sits. 
very similar risk profile, infection, hemorrhage, lead damage, um, the kind of 10-year outcome study did show some incidences of memory issues, suicidality, uh, mood issues, again, which is also seen in the general population that has medically uncontrolled epilepsy. So we have only been implanting RNS here at Children's for a couple of years. We don't really have long-term data outcomes yet. You know, it is sort of our, our newest device. But, um, you know, and, and at this point, again, it's sort of being done in patients that have failed not only medications, but often also VNS, other things. Um, but we're sort of constantly talking about, should we do this kind of more as, as the next line thing um, this was a 13-year-old boy, had seizure onset at about two years of age, multiple seizure types, had failed upwards of a dozen medications, uh, had had a VNS placed with sort of unclear efficacy, also had a callosotomy, which had some benefit, stopped the GTCs and atonic seizures, um, but was continuing to have seizures. And so we did go ahead and implant uh, central median thalamic RNS and and stimulation's been turned on. Stay tuned in terms of kind of efficacy and benefit. You know, I think one of the exciting things about it is we are seeing increased benefit, not just up to that one year mark, but five, ten years out, where it it's sort of a smart system, right? It's a closed loop system, and so it learns how to detect individual seizure patterns, and it gets better over time. Do you want to do so, this? So this one, uh, I just did, I had one patient come in last Thursday, this different patient. I just want to see, show you how cool this is. This is live ECOG. Basically, we put, we interrogate the machine, we show you the, the brain activities. That was the stimulation. You can see the change of everything, and then the ECOG come back. Great, and so just sort of reviewing kind of what we've been over, a comparison of the different devices. Um, infection rate is somewhere between one and 5%, uh, you know, slightly higher with the devices that do go intracranially into the scalp as compared to the neck. Um, again, slightly higher hemorrhage rate for devices that go uh, intracranially, although that's really only an initial risk, right? That's not... Um, that doesn't continue once you heal. Uh, and the leads, the intracranial part, ideally shouldn't need to be revised. Um, seizure reduction, you know, looks similar overall across the three devices. And, and generally, seizure reduction for all of these is reported as at least a 50% a reduction in seizure burden. You know, and so while we're not necessarily getting complete seizure freedom, we're talking about people that really don't have other options, right? They're having multiple seizures a day despite being on multiple medications, sometimes having tried surgery. And so even a 50% reduction is very significant in terms of quality of life and other things. Um, in terms of targets, you know, one goes in the neck. For some families, they're not ready to have brain surgery. That seems scary. Um, BNS seems a little bit safer, um, and then targets are, are variable intracranially. I would argue that all of these are minimally invasive surgeries. <laughs> um, you'll hear a lot more about our larger invasive resective surgeries this afternoon, uh, slightly different types of stimulation. Um, but importantly, all of the programming is really done transcutaneously, right? So it's non-invasive, kids come in, there's an iPad, right, that we can check the settings, adjust them, um, and it, it also gives patients a feeling of agency in their own treatment, right? As we're, they can look at it, they can see the squiggly lines. Um, and I think that can be really beneficial. General advantages of neurostimulation. Don't have to worry about allergies. Uh, there's no drug interactions. And you are compliant, right? You don't have to remember to take your medications. Um, I would also add to this list that the effects are sustained, right? Unless the battery 
starts to die and, and we hadn't caught it <laughs> early enough, right? We don't see that same wear off and, and maybe even more than sustained in terms of improving over time. What's also nice is most kids don't get off of their medications completely, but it's a completely different mechanism of action um, with, with really little to no side effects from a you know, drug systemic standpoint. Um, and for all of these devices, not only do we see an improvement in seizure burden, but we see uh, real changes in terms of improved quality of life, you know, a lot of the neuropsych outcomes, and importantly, a reduction in the risk of SUDEP. Um, I think we've sort of been through all of this. It's safe, it's effective. Um, we do talk about it still as a palliative treatment, meaning that typically the the expectation is not seizure freedom. There are case examples of people that have become seizure free, but that's generally uh, not the thought, um, but it's, it's still a huge benefit. Uh, the kind of easy way to think about it is about 50% of patients get 50% seizure reduction. I would argue that we're doing better than that. Um, and then, you know, I think it's exciting. We still don't know kind of how all of this works, and I think we're learning more and more every day especially with the newer devices that are implanted into the brain. It's giving us data that we didn't have access to before, long-term monitoring, that I would like to think as we learn more, we will be better and better at targeting, figuring out stimulation parameters, um, and hopefully helping more patients. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Those are wonderful talks. And now we will open the floor to questions. We have about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And so if you'd like, you can raise your hand or you can come up to one of the microphones and ask any of our speakers. We also have uh, our participants over WebEx. And so feel free to type your questions in the chat if you have any. Oh, hold on one second. Patty, one second. We'll give you the microphone. Okay. okay, this is from Jennifer from Portland, and she's curious about the definition for medically refractory epilepsy two or more epilepsy, and then two or more medications at maximum doses with continued seizures of, sorry, I got to scroll down, uh, of any frequency. And then what about meds that are discontinued because of the side effects before maximum doses are achieved? Does that make sense? So I think the question is um, asking about someone who's been tried on multiple medicines at, mul at maximum doses. Yeah. And then what are, is the question, what are the next options? Or... Sorry, my screen is so small sure. here. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I just want to clarify the question is that uh, even a patient has tried multiple medications, no efficacy, and what other options? That's I think hard. neuromodulation, I, I think it is good option. And the VNS definitely is well studied in pediatric population. Even though DBS and the RNS has not been approved by FDA, but we are doing this regularly now. I think more data will come out. But I strongly believe VNS might be the first best choice. And definitely the diet, if possible, if feasible. Yeah, and a little bit later today, we'll talk about other surgeries that we have as options and dietary therapies for epilepsy. I think also part of the question was whether when you're trying to decide if someone has refractory epilepsy, if medications, if you couldn't continue them, do, continue them do, due to side effects. When we consider a medication, failed is not a great word, but if a medication hasn't been effective, um, if you were not able to get up to a reasonable dose of it, just due to the severity of the side effects, you started it and, and immediately made you feel sick, 
we don't necessarily consider that a, um, a so-called so, so failed medication if you could not really tolerate it long enough to see if it, it worked well enough or not. Um, we try and consider medications that you were able to, to keep taking and were able to increase to a reasonable dose where we would expect it to have some sort of efficacy um, to be able to actually treat seizures. I believe that was part of the question. And it sounded like another part of the question was the definition of medically refractory epilepsy. And I think generally we do consider that with two or more failed medications. I think that's kind of a general operating definition that we use. Hopefully we answered all the parts of that question. <laughs> there are some people where even after they fail a single medication, we may consider them uh, very likely to become refractory and maybe should be assessed very early for any uh, neuromodulation or surgery, even after uh, failing one medication. And that's usually if they have certain types of brain malformations or certain types of brain injuries, something that we know is always there and is always going to be there. So the likelihood that it's going to continue to cause problems is very high, as opposed to other patients who have epilepsy, where we do a brain scan and their brain looks completely normal. I think we sort of jumped into some of the treatment options and maybe skipped over how, how we get there, right? How we determined that which option is right for, for each patient. And um, I think actually sitting up here is a great example of all the people involved that make that decision. <laughs> so we have a patient who, who has what we've determined to have medically refractory epilepsy. So failed, sometimes just a single medication, certainly two medications um, in the setting of those medications being you know, properly chosen, the right doses, not stopped just because of side effects, taken regularly, um, and that patient gets referred to kind of our surgical epilepsy group, right? It's a multidisciplinary group consisting of surgeons, neurologists, neuropsychologists, we have geneticists, we have neuroradiologists, um, and those kids get, you know, a full workup imaging that, you know, Dr. Patrick talked a lot about both structural and functional EEG data, um, neuropsych evaluation, lots of other things, and then we sort of all put our heads together and see is there a focus, something that we can take out, that again, we'll talk more about those options this afternoon, or is this more of a you know, multifocal option, in which case we would go down the path of neuromodulation. So it's, it's very individualized, targeted to each patient, you know, their particular presentation, not just the seizure pattern, but their brain function in general, um, and kind of go from there. Yeah, we have a question in the audience. Pat, Patty, do you mind passing the microphone? Sure. Thank you. Just so our people on WebEx can hear. Great. Thank you. Thank you for such a great um, round of talks. And this is a question regarding um, the neurostimulation and, and neuromodulation. And I was just wondering, in a lot of our, our patients, the motor skills are, are really uh, challenging and a big um, area that impacts quality of life. And so I was wondering if you could expand on um, the effects of uh, the neuromodulation on motor skills, specifically in epilepsy patients, and then also how um, this may have affected the quality of life measurements in those studies. So for overall that uh, the three FDA approved devices, I think overall there is a increased quality for life. And the one part is the motor skills. For wing, as we know that not only reduce the seizure um, burden, also reduce the length of seizure and the quick recovery from the seizure. So definitely I think overall out of the three devices, they all have the overall benefit. And uh, for our VNS and DBS are very easy for the families. There's not, no other work to be done. For the RNIs, a little bit challenging because they require the family, I think daily upload their data and then they have to upload data to our database. And the case we presented, we suppose that's going to work, but we have not been able to find any data over three months because the family couldn't upload the data. That answer the question? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. I think just in terms of motor function, brain function in general, to the degree to which the seizures are causing that delay, 
better control of seizures leads to developmental gains, right? So with any treatment, my perspective is from the surgical side. So, you know, the patients who are well controlled on medications, I never see, but presumably <laughs> medically controlled patients or patients that we get seizure control with, with resective surgery or with neuromodulation, we see huge developmental gains following that. Um, none of the devices have a direct impact, sort of positive or negative, on the motor centers of the brain. So if, you know, from a pure stimulation standpoint, I would say there's not an effect. It's really more about seizure control. I think something important to remember with the patients that we see is that their brains are still developing, um, which is different than the adult patients. So even though we're not necessarily fixing anything um, with neuromodulation, um, it is uh, providing that avenue for brain development to occur, and that's why we do see those gains. We have a time for probably one more question, if anyone. Great, thank you. So I'm the mother of a child uh, that just got referred actually up to Seattle Children's after five years of intractable epilepsy. And we've tried three different medications. And what I get asked a lot is, is she tolerating them well? And one thing that I have a really difficult time deciphering is because the seizures and epilepsy themselves can cause aggressive behavior, psychosocial impacts, et cetera, is it the child? Is it the seizures or is it the medication? And when we try a new medication, I don't see a ton of, we have all these issues already and they've been there for years. So I don't know how to answer that question. And I'm just curious if you have any insights on how to detect new side effects in new medications, because we did just start another one last night, um, versus uh, the, the effects of the seizures themselves. That is a wonderful question. And you point out how difficult it is uh, to determine what is really making the biggest impact on how a child feels. I think most commonly when I run into a very obvious medication side effect, it's often we started a new side effect and they are a zombie. They are so groggy. It is something very more concrete, such as extreme sleepiness, extreme belly pain, a very new side effect. It's a little bit harder, as you say, if it's a question of, well, what about mood? What about behavior? What about sleep? Because that can be affected by so many things and can change from day to day. But when I feel most comfortable saying, yes, I think that's very clearly um, medication related, is that if you can see a clear before and after about something that is like fatigue or belly pain or something like that. But again, as you pointed out, frequent seizures also can cause fatigue. So if there's no change in the number of seizures you're seeing, for example, but all of a sudden this child needs three naps a day or is sleeping 16 hours a day, then I would say, well, there's no change in the number of seizures you're seeing, but you know, your poor kid's sleeping all day, that seems most likely to be medication related and probably not tolerated as well. Because I always think if I stop all your seizures, but you're asleep all day, that's really not a quality of life improvement. Some of the cognitive and behavioral side effects show up quite quickly and quite dramatically. Um, and so when that's the case, then I think that's when, from a neuropsych perspective, we're talking to the neurologist about like, oh, this this medication might not be a great one. Um, whereas if it's like, well, it seems the same, so I don't know if this medication is causing some of the cognitive behavioral problems in addition to the seizures, then that might just, it might be, but that might just be where we're at with trying to kind of um, pick a medication that's going to be as, as helpful as possible. We want to avoid the ones that cause the striking differences. <laughs> yeah, as she said, really the feedback from the neuropsychologist is often very specific. And also, truthfully, the parents, the parents are generally pretty savvy, and you, know, you, you honestly know your, your child the best, so often you have a sense of, yeah, as you pointed out, some of this may just be you know, who my child is or uh, you know, an effect of this long-term refractory epilepsy. But you know, we do want to follow up if you're saying, well, you know, I know that this could be a lot of things, but I've just got a feeling that it's this med because it's changed and you know, I've accounted for all the other possibilities and I've got a feeling it's this med. 
And it does help sometimes to be able to do additional testing, which occasionally sometimes I say, you know, I'm not sure what this is, let's get this more formal testing and see if we can clearly see a before and after effect, you know, especially if we haven't seen a big difference in seizures to really account for it. I'll just say one last thing in that I wouldn't worry too much about how you answer the question. It's our job to partner with you to figure that out. And so um, just describing what you're seeing and giving us the details that you have and trusting the instincts that you know your child. And if you've seen a shift, even if it's subtle, you know, bring it up. That's something that we can definitely talk about. And there may or may not be, you know, a right way to answer that question. But um, any little shifts are something that we're going to partner with you in figuring out, do we want to make changes? Do we want to see how this goes and kind of go from there? I just want to add one point that is clinically, I think I have many moms tell me the same story as you're telling me. So I think over the years, I learned that um, maybe that's the time you sit down to have a long discussion about what is the goal of care. Is it how many seizures, or how good sleep, or the other part of the function, which one you care the most? Is the patient awake, alert, learning new things, or the motor functions, or music, whatever your child enjoys? So I think sometimes I do give a little bit a drug holiday. I mean, I taper down medications to see where we're going with this before I pile on more medication, more treatment. And then you would know where are you going, and then you make a second goal what that would be. So I think this all over time, most of times, we can make things better for your children and for your family, even though we don't have a cure. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of our first session speakers and